Alex Batchelor from Orbit Discovery. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm not sure how many of us have uh, traveled over from Europe, but I'm, uh, I'm one of them. Um, I am CEO of Orbit Discovery, and I'll spend the next 15 minutes telling you a little bit about what we, uh, what we do. So um, we're a University of Oxford um, company, which founded at the beginning of, uh, of, of um, 2016. And it's, our company is based on a peptide display technology that came out of the Weatherall Institute, which is one of the um, university departments. We've got two academic founders, uh, Graham Ogg and uh, Terry Rabbits. And since we formed the spin out, we've, we've taken the technology from Graham's lab, put it in our own laboratory. Uh, we've now got um, nine people working in the lab. Uh, we've just raised follow on money, so we're um, expanding a little bit. We'll be up to about 15 by the end of the year. Um, and the whole thing is based on our technology, which we believe gives us a, the, the potential to build the most powerful peptide display platform that there is. Now, I'm not saying it is today the world's most powerful peptide display platform, but uh, I think that in two years' time, it stands a very good chance of, uh, of getting there. So my presentation mixes a little bit of what we can do, as in things that we can actually do today, uh, and what we could do, which are things that what our technology enables us to do where we've got proof of concept on various things, but we haven't really reduced it to practice in a way that's a really um, automated, screenable format. So as I go through, I'll try and highlight what's real and what's not quite real yet. Um, but the key things are that the technology supports everything that you might want to do to make better peptides, so um, incorporation of non-naturals, constrained structures, post-translation modifications, and so on. Um, and it's presented in such a way that we can address what we believe is a broadish range of um, potential targets. And we can do that, we can present things to those targets in a way that will ultimately give more drug-like molecules at the end of the process rather than um, what most display technologies give, which is um, some hits. Um, we're using our technology in um, a small number of in-house programs where um, we have an academic collaborator with their interest in a target and we're identifying peptides that um, modulate the target. And we so far have two commercial collaborations. Um, the first one we still haven't announced. The second one we did announce recently, that's with, um, with Zealand Pharma. And our investors are all um, currently Oxford focused, although we're always very keen to get investors whose names don't have Oxford in them um, to come and talk to us. Um, for the minute, they all have Oxford in them, um, and they're all very supportive, and they're trying to build big companies in the, uh, in the Oxford area. So when I'm talking to investors, I like to present the, um, the opportunity for peptides. So I know everybody in this room knows this already, but I'm surprised that nobody said it so far, so I'm going to say it anyway. Um, peptides are a very underrepresented um, drug class. Of the trillion dollars of global sales in drugs every year, they only account for about 2%. And um, it's our belief that that 2% is destined to grow because peptides potentially give the benefits of larger biologics combined with some of the benefits of, um, of small molecules. And the reason for that, we believe, um, we're not biased at all, is because of display technologies and gradually improving display technologies. So if you look at the history of peptide drugs, generally based on an existing peptide, um, either replacing something or modifying something um, that's naturally occurring. With the advent of display technologies, then we can find peptides that, um, that can be used in targeting, for example, in infectious disease or in oncology. And we can actually find peptides that have um, functional responses for potentially um, autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular disease, and, and broader disease areas. So because of this and because the display technologies are improving, um, it's our contention that that 2% will become 5%, and then instead of being 100 people in this room, there'll be 250 people in the room and will be a, a bigger crowd. So where do we fit? So we see ourselves as the latest generation of peptide display. We think we're currently the most powerful. We doubt we'll always be the most powerful, so we obviously have to try and improve all the time. But as we look at um, how things have evolved, then obviously phase display um, is there first. And I've got some attributes down the, down the left here, and I've got some ticks and X's and question marks, which with this audience is obviously really dangerous because you'll probably all argue that just about every one of my ticks and crosses is wrong. But um, the main point I think I'm trying to make is that we've got more ticks, um, which is really just about doing the things that phase display does well, doing the things that mRNA and another in vitro display does well, and combining them so that you're getting the, uh, the, the best of both. And a key piece of that is um, this bottom line, which is multiple copies. We think that 
displaying multiple copies of a peptide, which phage does um, in, in you know, limited numbers, um, is beneficial. In the orbit technology, we display many, many copies of each peptide, and we think that gives us some, um, some helpful attributes. So this is how our um, technology works. It's uh, DNA encoded um, technology. So we start with um, a DNA library where each piece of DNA obviously codes for um, a scaffold protein and it has a region that codes for the peptide. And we link a single piece of DNA to a, a small bead. We then amplify the DNA on that bead and then we use in vitro transcription translation to build a scaffold protein which then presents a peptide to the outside. And when we do this, we, we finish with each bead being coated with many thousands of copies of, um, of the peptide. At this point, if we want to include non-natural amino acids, then we just use codon switching and synthetic tRNAs to, um, to do that. Having generated the library, we can then pass that library across the target. So if this green circle is a, a dish, and we do traditional panning, then we can just capture what binds um, or what doesn't. If the green circle represents a cell, then we can screen against a cell surface. Um, and we can again catch the things that, um, that bind or, or, or what doesn't. And then after the selection, we simply capture the beads, sequence the DNA, and from that can see what the, um, what the peptide was. And our process typically then goes round again with uh, either enrichment or with bias libraries to um, focus in on, on um, particular motifs. So our business proposition is one of building on two key pillars of differentiation. So the first one is capturing the greatest diversity. So you can look at diversity, obviously, in terms of how big is the library. Um, we've got some work to do there. We've got a reasonable size library, but it needs to be bigger. We can also look at diversity in terms of the potential types of things that could be presented. And this is where we think that with incorporation of non-natural amino acids and then the ability to do chemistry on the beads after the, after the peptides have been generated, that gives us the opportunity to give um, enormous diversity. And then the second thing is how we do the screen. And when we took the technology from Graham's lab at the end of 2015, beginning of last year, um, we were screening very much the old-fashioned way of putting a target on a surface and seeing what binds. Um, now we're moving away from that and screening against target in solution. And the benefit of that is that then we can screen against targets in a native conformation and our bead becomes a carrier that captures target um, out of solution. It also means that we can mix multiple proteins together and we can see if we've got selectivity at the beginning, which is, um, which is fairly useful. And then we've also demonstrated um, the ability to present, for example, agonists to GPCRs and see downstream signaling in a cell. So there's a sufficient um, concentration of peptide on a bead surface that we can trigger a, um, an agonist response and see that um, in, in, in the form of a, a cell lighting up with a reporter and then we can sort out those cells that have lit up on those that haven't and capture the peptides. And so taking these things, the diversity and the workflows, and combining them, we really believe we're building this premier um, drug discovery engine. And this is just represented again here. Um, this is where we get into the future a little bit. Um, for the minute, the, the breadth of the arrow represents diversity. That's potential diversity for the minute. That's not actual diversity. The length of the arrow represents increasing target complexity. Um, we can get to here. We've got a route to here, and we're still working on that. And we believe that in two years' time, we'll be, um, be at that point. In terms of performance, um, I've got to go quite quickly. Um, Terry Rabbits, one of our founders, is very interested in KRAS, and he has a, um, a heavy chain antibody that binds to the... Um, to the switch region in KRAS, and using that, derive some peptides um, in silico that um, inhibit RAS pretty well. Um, we then ran a screen, and we discovered that we could also generate peptides that um, bind to KRAS and inhibit it. And um, by pure chance, one of these peptides that came out is quite similar to one of the peptides that, um, well, that was developed in, in Terry's lab. And when we look at the, um, its ability to block binding, then it falls in the middle of the peptides that were, um, that were generated there. So that was sort of an encouraging start. Um, the very first work was done with GP120. So I didn't realize until about lunchtime today that this is the, the town where Fusion was made. Is that right? 
Um, so we've got fusion here and blocking DNA, uh, blocking HIV um, infection into cells. Um, and then we've got some peptides that came from an orbit screen, and some of them, albeit at a pretty hefty dose, um, as someone getting somewhere close to the, uh, to, to, the, to the levels of fusion at blocking that infection. And then a third example looks at um, probing T cell receptors. Um, because we build this scaffold protein, um, that can be a scaffold that, um, that presents to a T cell. So um, in this case, the scaffold protein is beta 2 microglobulin with a linker and then a T cell epitope. And we refolded HLA heavy chain around that to make beads that were displaying the epitope in the, in the right way so that when you then gave it to a, a T cell population, it could actually um, recognize the epitope. In this case, um, the, we did it in a, in a filter plate. So we just took a, took a clonal T cell population, mixed it with a library, um, incubated, and then washed everything that wasn't bind, bound through the membrane, and then captured the beads um, to see what we bound. And for three T cells with known specificity, we were able to demonstrate in the first case that we were catching the anchors. Um, properly and we were enriching for the, um, for the right epitopes um, for those T cell receptors. So as our platform develops, um, it's building in three areas. So in terms of capability, uh, we're in this area for the minute and we're going into this area. In automation, we're at this point. We've got proof of concept here and we've got a fairly obvious path to being able to screen multiple targets in parallel. In terms of targets, we can screen just protein, obviously. Um, we can screen on the cell surface for binders, and we're getting some early work with, um, with GPCRs. And in our future, we see more difficult cell surface targets, and ultimately, once we've got cell penetrating libraries, the ability to target um, inside the cell. So in the last minute, this is our business model. It's a fairly well-tested business model, um, very similar to Peptidream, very similar to Adimab. Um, we build a platform which will become stronger and stronger over time. And as we develop IP, we'll get to the point where we can potentially outlicense that platform. In the meantime, we're probing some in-house targets, but we're also putting a lot of effort into um, joint R&D on a typical um, paid, paid research, milestones, royalty um, model. And we believe that's a, a good way of building a lot of value in the company whilst also serving the peptide discovery market very well. And with that, I think my 15 minutes is up. Perfect.